Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This is astronaut Bill Shepard using a Macintosh portable on the space shuttle in 1990. Now he's studying human computer interactions in zero G, but he's about to make one of my favorite bits of space footage ever. Yes, the old school Macintoshes would have a motorized disk drive that would eject the disk gently for you. But of course, if you weren't there to catch it in zero G, it would just float around the cabin. Other computers at the time, they were, had mostly manual ejection systems, which usually required turning a lever and pulling the disk out. But on the Mac, it was all automatic. If you never used the original Mac OS to eject the disk, what you had to do was drag the icon for the disk to the trash can, and then the disk would eject, rather than being deleted, as we might think these days. The whole reason NASA had flown these very expensive consumer devices to orbit was because they wanted to see how graphical user interfaces could be operated in zero gravity. At the time, NASA was flying another computer called the Grid Compass, which was all keyboard controlled, but they anticipated that they would need to get with modern ways and start using graphical user interfaces, which required cursor controls. So this is part of an experiment called the cursor control experiment. What they were really testing was the trackballs and other control systems. NASA was looking to the future and they realized that the computers of the future would have graphical user interfaces and the astronauts would have to know how to use them in zero gravity. For example, it would seem obvious that using a mouse in zero G where it would constantly float off the surface would be not ideal. Obvious, sure, but NASA scientists wanted to test it nevertheless. So they first did this on STS-29 in 1989, and they didn't have a Mac portable back then. They had a computer called the Grid Compass, which had been flown since early shuttle missions. There was a need for a computer that could control a bunch of experiments and run extra software, and so this is what they selected. There were a few variants of it. It was mostly keyboard controlled, had its own operating system, and you've probably seen it on screen if you watched a bunch of movies from the 80s. In particular, the Colonial Marines used it to operate their automated sentry guns. So this sturdy little computer was used as the basis of the experiment. They had two devices, a trackball and a mouse. The mouse was an optical mouse which back then needed a special mouse pad which would be velcroed to the astronaut's leg and they tried to use it. They gave the mouse a score of 1 out of 10 saying that it probably needed three hands to use correctly. The trackball scored a 7 but they realised that there was work still needed to be done on human input. And so a year later, they came back with another set of experiments, this time flying on STS-41. STS-41, its primary mission was to launch the Ulysses spacecraft, which went across the North Pole and South Pole of the Sun. But it also carried the first Macintosh into space, a Mac portable. Now, why did they bring a Mac portable? Well, you know, this was 1990. The perception was if you were an accountant, you had a PC. If you were an artist, you had a Mac. And of course, if you were a cool person that played games, then you had either an Atari ST or an Amiga. But the point is, the Mac had amazing support for external control devices. They'd clearly tested a lot on the ground before they decided what to take to space. What they, they took was the built-in trackball that came with the Mac Portable, and there was another device called the Felix, which is like a captive mouse on its own pad. I think the testing showed that neither device was still quite up for the task. Like the trackball would still bounce around inside its housing and produce random movements when you moved and lifted your fingers. The Felix was kind of better in space, but it still had random motions and things like that. But it doesn't look like this was the only thing they used it for, because I think they were testing it also as a possible replacement for the grid as the payload general support computer. You can see here that they actually installed the software on both machines. They clearly had to port it to the Macintosh, which was a completely different operating system. The Macintosh was, of course, a huge upgrade over the Compass. It could support up to 8 megabytes of memory. It had a 16 megahertz Motorola 68000 processor. The Compass had 340 kilobytes of bubble memory storage for programs, but the Mac had a 1.4 megabyte floppy disk drive. 
But ultimately, NASA went to ThinkPad starting in 1993 with STS-61, the first servicing mission to the Hubble Space Telescope. Those ran Windows and MS-DOS, and they used ThinkPads right up till the end of the Space Shuttle program. But the Mac Portable would return to space later on STS-43, and again, its primary mission function was to test these pointing devices. Now, in these images, it looks like they've hooked up a giant control stick to the computer. And you might imagine that a bunch of pilots would see this potentially as a good way of controlling the computer. However, if you look a little closer, what you realize is that the actual control is on the thumb. There's like a little uh, hat that you move with your thumb to adjust the location of the mouse cursor. And then the trigger is what clicks the mouse button, whereas you're just basically holding that big handle so you don't float around. But this Mac was used for an even more important role in space history. It sent the first email from space. The space shuttle actually had a printer on board where they would print out commands and messages and instructions that were you know, sent up from the ground. I think the data rate was something like 2400 baud, which was enough for most purposes. But it wasn't until this mission that the computer nerds figured out how to hook a general computer up to this system, use the Apple Talk protocol to send email across the network, and that was the first email getting sent from space. After this mission, I don't think they used this digital connectivity capability until they started flying the ThinkPads with their uh, docking stations. While this mission never produced anything quite as amazing as the floating floppy disk, it did give us this. Now, this is Shannon Lucid using a Mac. Why is it more interesting than all the other photos, I hear you ask? Well, if you look over at the right side, you'll see that she's not wearing like her flight suit. She's wearing shorts. And therefore, to stop the computer floating away, she has duct taped a computer to her legs. Anyway, as far as I know, it never flew on any other flights, and we don't know where the computer itself is today. Some of the computers from the shuttle have turned up in museums or in private collections, but this one I haven't seen. It's also not the first Apple computer to fly to space on the space shuttle, because back in 1982, they were developing a plant growth experiment, and looking at the hardware they needed to control it, they realized that they could take a off-the-shelf Apple computer and use that to control their system. And they presented this to NASA, and NASA said, well, this is great, but that computer has socketed chips, and you can't do that. So they pretty much had to rebuild the entire computer from the chip, like take the chips off the board, put them onto another board. But the experiment apparently flew in 1983. And while there are no Macs in the space station that I know of, there are a lot of iPads. They've been using them for over a decade. Instead, they're basically use them like pilots would use knee boards. So frequently you'll see them like Velcroed to astronauts' legs, or they will be on the walls of their sleeping areas where they are using them to watch you know, TV and chill out. SpaceX have also been using iPads on the Dragon spacecraft as electronic flight bags. Finally, there's one other portable computer that flew on the space shuttle, and I'm not calling this a laptop because it is a like five kilogram, 10 pound, you know, Panasonic monster. And it's being used here by a shuttle pilot to fly a space shuttle simulator from the flight deck of the space shuttle while they're in orbit. You can see that they've bungeed uh, like another control stick in front of that control stick, the, the actual shuttle's control stick, so they can practice landing and re-entry after they've been on, in, on orbit for a couple of weeks and they might be a little rusty. So, you know, they wouldn't do this on their own. They would have other crew making their call outs just to make sure that they had their uh, everything rehearsed. It was known by the acronym PILOT for Portable In-Flight Landing Operations Trainer. And I'm going to say it looks a lot of fun. I wish I could play this. I wish I could get this obscure NASA software that they use to train astronauts. Well, turns out they actually just used a PC simulator. This is Shuttle, the spaceflight simulator, which was created by a company called Vector Graphics, released on Virgin Software. And it does look like they might have made some changes to the user interface, or maybe they made some configuration changes, but I kind of now really want to play this. Apparently at the time it was kind of famous for being a hardcore simulator. It was once rated one of the 50 worst games ever made because it was so complicated and unforgiving for the average player. Sounds like something that's right up my street. 
Later in the shuttle program, as the ThinkPads were upgraded and became fast enough to run this, uh, they would ditch the custom laptop and just use the you know payload general computer system. And yeah, as for the original cursor control experiment that started all this, well, NASA ended up just going with what was built into the ThinkPads, either the nub, or as we like to call it, keyboard nipple in early versions, or the touchpad that has come to dominate the laptop computer interface. In the end, laptop designers came up with the best solution for 1G, which happened to also be the best solution for 0G. I'm Scott Manley, and if you are a floppy disk in a Mac in space, fly safe.